Okay. And I'm all set. Uh, I guess there was some sort of a announcement, I guess, about a career fair. <laughs> so, can I switch it back? Any questions for me about anything in this course? Yeah, the homework. Um, I don't have any. Yeah, the mailbox. My mailbox downstairs. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Or hand it to you. Whichever way. Okay. Whichever way. If you want to drop it in my office, I'll be there. Okay. Uh, if you want to drop it in the mailbox, that's fine too. By four o'clock today. Okay. Um, the next assignment I will post it by Wednesday morning, and so to give you week from uh, Wednesday. And I want to do a little bit more about Laplace transform today and the next one is we can tell you about Laplace transform. What was your experience on the first assignment in terms of timing? It was okay? Yeah. It's not bad, just learning math lab. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's always uh, my past experience too and this class is not very different. Now people who are comfortable with uh, computers and that lab and there are people who need help. And uh, so what I will, I have done in the past and I'm willing to do is have a voluntary MATLAB session for people who want to attend in the lab. I need to find a time and place, uh, in the place in the lab, I need to find a time. And uh, so I will bring some material for you to work on, but if you have your own assignment to work on, if you can schedule it, such a way that when you have the assignment you want to work there, then I'll be there around to help you answer any questions and take you through a little bit more exposure to MATLAB. So we can do this once a week, um, sometimes during the period when an assignment is uh, with you. Right, I'll let you go for an assignment. So what would be a good time in terms of class schedule for you guys? Is there any before 9 a.m.? I'm here with son, but <laughs> it's a good time for you guys. 8 o'clock in the morning is a good time. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. How many of you will feel that you you would want to attend something like that? Oh no, I would. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, um, you pick. You pick. You want to do it next Tuesday? Before the homework is due? Or you can do Thursday, you can get started. <laughs> the Thursday, is, we can do it this Thursday. And we can be flexible if you have both next week. If it is better, we can do it Tuesday. So this Thursday, we will have it. And so. Is there a is there a projector there? I have not been to that lab. There's no projector there. So I cannot really demonstrate anything to you in the class. Okay, I need to check in the department whether they have a portable projector that can come and project it on the wall or something. And then um, as I do it, you can do it. That will be an advantage, I think, of having it there. Um, okay, I will find out something and let you know my Wednesday. So we'll tentatively meet this Thursday morning, 8 o'clock, in the computer lab.
people to like ball games and shit too. It is. So we can do that. I don't know whether they have license for it or not. Uh, it's called Adobe Connect Pro, and what it does is it actually allows you to listen to a class from anywhere in the internet. So I could start a class here and broadcast the sound, and you will see an identical copy of my screen on your computer. And then the program allows you to interact. You can raise your hand. You can ask questions. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't know. I have to explore that. But this program, I know I've used it. It's very good for distance learning uh, kind of activity. Okay. Um, you find the space in the class okay? Everything is fine? Okay. Um, in the last lecture, we started reviewing Laplace transform. Uh, we introduced the definition of the Laplace transform and uh, looked at some of the properties of Laplace transform, linearity in particular. And uh, the main reason for looking at the Laplace transform is for us to be able to solve dynamical differential equations, differential equation of the type that you have solved in your current assignment, for example, the first assignment. Uh, we need to go through one more step, and we will do that after we finish the review of Laplace transform, that is linearization. What is linearization of a nonlinear differential equation? So we'll look at that. But let's continue with the Laplace transform um, review or theory behind it. And what the next thing that we need to look at is how do I transform a derivative? We have seen how to transform a function, a constant function, e to the power a t, sine t, cos sine t, and we've built a theory. Okay? And all this is done by simply using the definition of a Laplace transform, which is integral from 0 to infinity, whatever the nature of the function is f of t, you multiply this by e to the power of minus f t, and integrate it with respect to time. So time disappears from your integral, and that gives you a new function, which is a function of f in the Laplace domain. And necessarily, if you're just going to transform constants or x or x squared or e to the power x, uh, there's really no difference. You have one representation in the x domain, another representation in the s domain. The real advantage of uh, Laplace transform comes in when you look at the derivative of a function. You know, like transform a derivative of a function, how does that look like? And towards the end of the class, we said that it is given by a formula like this, which is the function s multiplied by the Laplace transform of the original function. Okay? So the original function is f of t. Here I have the derivative of f of t. And I want to take the Laplace transform of the derivative of the function f. And that is given by s times the Laplace transform of the function itself minus f evaluated at 0. Okay? Um, <coughs> Now, is that clear? Do you need an explanation or an example illustration of that? What I'm going to do next is show why that is so. Because there is really no magic to it. It's all simple application of the basic definition. This is the definition for Laplace transform. We are going to apply the definition. We have so far applied to any function, and we are saying now I can apply it to derivative and integral. When I particularly apply to derivative, it simplifies the problem. Because if, I play, if I know the Laplace transform of the original function, okay, so this is the original function f of t. If I can find out the Laplace transform of that, how do I do that? By simply looking in the table. Because I already have a constructed table. For simple functions, what is the Laplace transform? And then I multiply it by s, I'm going to get the Laplace transform of the derivative. Okay? So take the original Laplace transform, multiply it by s, it is equivalent to taking the derivative of the function. Why is that so? Okay. So we're going to, as I said, apply the definition. So here I have the derivative of the function d of dt. So the, the definition of Laplace transform is that function, whatever the function is, d of dt is going to be a new function. For example, if the function is e to the power at, d of dt will be what? a times e to the power at. Okay? That's what I'm going to substitute. 
Then I'm going to multiply this by e to the power minus s t, which is what the definition of Laplace transform calls for, and integrate it with respect to t from 0 to infinity. Okay? As I go through, if any step is not clear, please put up your hand and ask me. Okay? So now what I'm doing is, I'm saying I've applied the definition. So in this step, I have applied the definition of a Laplace transform. Now I'm going to do the actual integration. Okay? So I'm switching around e to the power s t and ds dt. Okay, I'm just switching the position around. Why? Because I want to cancel this dt. Okay? So I cancel the dt, and what I'm left with is e to the power minus s t df. Integral of e to the power minus s t df between 0 to infinity. Now, this is of the form integral of u dv. Right? Some function u multiplied by some differential of a function b. What does that remind you of? Integration by, integration by part. Immediately when you see that, you should remember that formula. And so the integral by part is integral of u dv is uv minus integral of v du. That's the formula for integration by part. Okay? So I'm going to apply that. So this is going to be u and this is going to be dv. So the function f is like v. And the function u is e to the power minus fc. So u is e to the power minus fc. And v is just f, but evaluated between the limits 0 and infinity. So this simply says the lower limit is 0, the upper limit is infinity here. The lower limit is 0, the upper limit is infinity. Okay? Minus integral of v. v is f du, derivative of u. u is e to the power minus st. Okay? Derivative of e to the power minus st. Now, what happens to the first term when you evaluate it? Remember, at t equal to infinity, e to the power minus infinity is zero. Okay, so that minus the lower limit. The lower limit is e to the power zero. E to the power zero is what? One. Okay, one times this function evaluated at zero. That is how you get the function evaluated at zero. Okay. And this information typically comes to us from an initial condition for a differential equation. And we will see that later on, how to uh, evaluate that particular uh, term. Now, the second term is integration. Uh, the, the first state is derivative of d with respect to d to the minus s t. It's going to be f remains as it is in the previous part. Derivative of e to the power minus s t is minus s times derivative uh, of uh, e to the power minus s t times dt. Okay. So derivative of e to the power minus st is e to the power minus st times the derivative of this, which is going to be minus s dt by simply applying the chain rule. Okay. And that gives you a minus s, and that's what comes here. So it becomes plus. The minus sign becomes plus sign because of this minus s. But the integration is just with respect to t, not with respect to s. That's why I'm able to take the s outside of the integral. Okay, so this I'm able to take outside of the integral. The, devil, the integration is only with respect to t. So what I'm left with is f times e to the power minus s t times d t. But what is that? That is the Laplace transform of f. Right? That is the definition of a Laplace transform of a function. So any function multiplied by e to the power minus s t d t between the limits zero and infinity. So this entire term is your Laplace transform. And then you have S already. So this is why we say that the derivative, Laplace transform of the derivative is simply Laplace transform of the function itself multiplied by S with this initial condition evaluated there. So this is kind of a proof of how we develop that particular formula. Any questions on that? Every step is clear? Because now we're going to apply that repeatedly to calculate higher derivatives for second derivative. Okay? It turns out for the second derivative it is as if you are multiplying the Laplace transform of the function by x squared. So every time you take a derivative it is equal to multiplying the function by one more f. Okay? So the demonstration of that is goes like this. This is the Laplace transform of the second derivative. Second derivative is written as derivative of the first derivative which is the second derivative, right? That's the definition. So, maybe let me ask you, what am I doing there? 
after from this step to this step, what have I done? If I keep explaining, it looks like, yeah, it's obvious. <laughs> when you have to think about it and explain to me, that shows that you have actually grasped it. I cannot quote it, so there must be some. Uh, I have taken, I guess I have to go close to this. I'm trading this at some, some, some. If you want, you can it by wider, this is whatever. So I'm taking the Laplace transform of the derivative of something. Okay. So that is going to be x times the Laplace transform of, of that something, whatever that is, minus that something evaluated at t equal to zero. This is the first formula that we developed. When I have the Laplace transform of a derivative, it is simply S times the Laplace transform of that thing minus that thing evaluated at t equal to zero. Does that make sense? This is the application of the first derivative. But now, what I have, that thing is going to be the derivative. So I need to take the Laplace transform of that one more time. What I'm doing is recursively applying the rule that I have. What is the Laplace transform of the derivative? Recursively twice. Okay. So outside I have this x, and then the plus transform of the function now. Derivative of the function. So that is x times the plus transform of the function, minus that function x, not in prime, but x, so that is equal to zero. And of course I have minus this algorithm, which is nothing but x prime. That's why the derivative of x zero. So the formula for the second derivative, the plus transform of the second derivative is x squared multiplied by the Laplace transform of the original function for which we took the second derivative, right? So it's minus x times the function evaluated at zero minus the derivative of the function evaluated at zero. These things come from initial conditions. Any questions on this? Okay. From there, by induction, we are jumping into the nth derivative. What is the Laplace transform of the nth derivative of a function? Okay. It is nothing but s to the power n multiplied by the Laplace transform of that function, that function f, Laplace transform of that. Minus, you will get this whole series of terms, s to the power n minus 1 multiplied by f, the function evaluated at 0, s to the power n minus 2 multiplied by the first derivative evaluated at zero all the way to the n minus one derivative at zero. So all these conditions are basically evaluated at t equal to zero. Okay? They come from initial conditions. Now this looks like too much of theory. Why are we doing all this theory? Why do we need it? Now comes the application. Okay? You have derived a general formula. You don't have to remember it. In an exam, I'll give you a formula sheet which will contain, in general, this expression. For example, this expression will be in a formula sheet, okay? along with all the table of Laplace transforms and stuff. If there is a problem that asks you to develop uh, the, what do we call the transfer function later on. Okay? Now, let's take an example. The, the question now is, find the Laplace transform of x sub t that satisfies the differential equation and initial condition. If I give you a piece of paper at this stage and say, solve me that differential equation and get the information, can you do it? No. You have forgotten? Or you have not seen? You have seen it. You have forgotten it. So if you have forgotten it, it's just a matter of jogging your memory, right? I can give you the traditional way that you would have done, which would be to write something called a characteristic equation for the differential equation, right? The characteristic equation would be nothing but you can call this m cubed plus four times m squared plus five times m plus two times k plus that, and then take the roots of the polynomial, and the solution will be x plus less e to the power m one two m two two. So you get a third order polynomial, and you have three roots. Okay, these concepts are important because we're going to need them in this course. But I'm not going to hold you responsible for solving the differential equation except through the plus transform. Okay? The plus transform you'll find that it is an extremely easy task to do. Now this is let me ask you a few questions. Is this a linear differential equation or a nonlinear differential equation? 
So now try to handle the linear. Okay. What is the unknown that you are looking solving for? X. What is the independent variable? T. Right. The dependent variable is X. So you are looking for something like X as a function of T, a solution that does something like this, evolves in time. Very much like what you did in your first assignment, but in your first assignment you had two first order equations. Here you have a single third order equation. Later on we will show that they are equivalent. You can convert this into a system of three first order equations, for example. And you could use ODE45 to get a solution to this new molecule. Okay? But because it's linear, meaning there is no sine of x or e to the power x or x squared, none of these terms exist in here. That's what makes it a linear problem. Okay. Your current assignment that you did, or you're doing, is that linear or nonlinear? Nonlinear because you had a square root of h from here. Okay. That makes it nonlinear. Okay. If that is the case, then Laplace transform doesn't help us. Laplace transform works only with linear equations. It's a linear theory. So what you're going to do is take this you should be able to do. Given a model, you need to identify whether it's linear or nonlinear, whether it is time varying, or what do we mean by time varying? If any of these coefficients that are multiplying depends on time, then you'll say it's a time varying linear equation. Okay? So in this case, it's all constant coefficients. So that uh, characteristic root method would work, but that last transform also would work. So what we are going to do is take the Laplace transform of this entire equation, okay? This entire equation, I'm just going to take the Laplace transform. That's what I'm doing here. So L is the operator, Laplace transform operator. It's operating on the entire equation, both left-hand side and right-hand side. So you also have it on the right-hand side, Laplace transform of 2, okay? And I'm using the linearity principle, which means if I take the Laplace transform of the sum of these four terms, linearity tells me it's the same as Laplace transform of each term added together. Okay? So Laplace transform of the first term plus Laplace transform of the second term, etc. Okay? So this is possible because of the linearity. Okay? Next, I'm going to apply the rules that I have developed so far. For the third derivative, it's going to be s cubed times x of s. x is the function that I am now dealing with, unknown. Okay? So the Laplace term, so x of t is the solution in the time domain, but when I take the Laplace transform of that, I get x of s in the transform domain. That is the unknown. That is the unknown in the transform domain. Minus s squared times x zero, minus s times x prime zero, and x double prime zero. These are all initial conditions. But look at the initial condition. They're all given as zero. Okay? So this term drops out, this term drops out, this term drops out. In this particular problem, whether I give it to you as one or two, then you substitute the number. Okay? Then the next term is four times the Laplace transform of the second derivative. Okay? That is this term. The second term of the differential equation. Because the second derivative it is s squared times x of s minus s times x zero minus x prime zero. Again, these drop out for this particular initial condition. Then I have the third term, five times the first derivative, which is s times x s minus x zero, which also drops out. Okay? So I'm taking term by term the Laplace domain of each one of these, and continuing on, I'll get the Laplace transform of two times x. So that is simply 2 times the Laplace transform of x. On the right hand side, I have the Laplace transform of 2, which is 2 over s. We saw the Laplace transform of 1 as uh, simply 1 over s. So you can just take 2 as a factor, so that you get 2 over s on the right hand side. So the transform domain, then, I can collect all these x to the power, uh, like this term, this term, this term, because it's a common x of s, I factor that out, and I'm left with s cubed plus 4 s squared uh, plus 5 s, etc. Okay? And that's what I'm doing. So I'm solving, I'm separating x of s, and I'm getting x of s in terms of s in the transform domain. 
That's all I need to do. Question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can see it here, but you cannot see it. Okay. Okay. So I'm solving for x of s, and I move everything else to the right hand side after collecting all the terms. So I get a solution in the s domain. Now I need to invert that. How do I invert that one? Any ideas from your inverse the plus transform. You can look at the table, but if you look at the table, you're not going to find this particular polynomial, inverse of the particular polynomial. You will find in the table from the last lecture the plus transform for terms like 1, 1 over s, 1 over s squared, or 1 over s plus a, things like that. Okay? So somehow you need to rearrange this equation into those forms. And this is where we are going to see Partial fractions. Okay, uh, I'm going to introduce you. I mean, to recall partial fractions for you, but you don't need to do that if you have access to MATLAB because MATLAB can handle any complicated expression that you throw at it. Yeah, you can. You have to factor it. You have to factor it, and then you have to put it in partial fractions. Okay, and then you can look it up in the table. That's by hand. But if you have access to MATLAB, then All you need to do is, in symbolic processing, define that particular expression. So, since x, s, t, three symbols. Okay. So, I'm going to define that x of s. Okay. I guess I need to look at both of them at the same time. Maybe if you have a good memory, you can tell me. <laughs> okay, there it is. Okay, so I'm going to write this exactly as it appears there. The symbol x is going to be equal to 2 divided by s multiplied by s cubed plus 4 s square plus 5 s plus 2. If I make a mistake, correct me. Or if you don't understand anything, also ask me questions. Uh, can you see that? Is it too tiny in the back? Is that okay? So, I have defined the solution in the transform phase. This I did by hand, and then I have the solution as 2 divided by s times s times s times s times s times s times s So, at this stage, I can do symbolic processing. I can do a lot of simplifications with this. But all, all I want to do right now is just I Laplace. Inverse Laplace is called just I Laplace. What did I do? I can type the name of the function correctly. That is a solution in time domain. It's an analytical expression. It's not a numerical expression, it's an analytical expression. Well, the solution to that differential equation is that 1 minus 2 t divided by e to the power of t and minus 1 over e to the power of 2 t. Okay. Now, if you want to look at how this function looks, how would you plot it? Does the plot command work? You've used plot command several times in your assignment. Now I X comma T, you, that's what you did in your original, but T was a vector of numbers, X was a vector of numbers, and you plotted that. Now here, this is a function, okay? So if you say plot X comma T, you don't understand what you're talking about. This is a frustrating part with MATLAB. Whenever you get a message like this, you need to know what am I doing wrong, right? How do I interpret this? So error using plot. Plot expects two columns of number, at least two columns of num numbers. Then it can plot one against x-axis against y-axis. What you have here is a function. Okay. There is another program called easy plot, 
and that plot any expression. You don't have to create a number. You just type easy plot. What is the expression I want to plot now? Am I making sense? If I'm not, please ask me. And I want to plot the function, but where is the function store? That's what I'm. This is an a and a and f. Okay. The solution is actually stored as a and f. So I need to pass that symbol to the easy plot routine. Okay. And then. then what it is going to do is it's going to take that expression and it's going to create a set of values for C and evaluate this expression to plot one against the other. All this is automatically done for you by the easy plot routine. So easy plot routine works with symbolic expressions that you want to plot. Plot alone works with numerical numbers. This is the graph it says. Okay. Now, does this make sense? Does this graph, this is the critical part that you need to look at. Does this look right? What do you know about this function? What should this function satisfy? Obviously, it should satisfy the differential equation because it's a solution. It should satisfy all the initial conditions. So the initial condition we started only from t equals to 0. So by default, easy plots pick from minus 6 to plus 6. I don't really care about minus 6 to 0, right? So you need to say, OK, don't plot that for me. Plot only from 0 to some number. So you need to know whether easy plot can do that. How do you find that? Help easy plot, OK? Now I'm just going to enter the number 0 to 10, for example. <coughs> Hoping that will be the next argument <laughs> that it will take. Now, does it look right? Not only is the function zero, at this point, what else did we say? The first derivative is zero, the second derivative is zero. Right? That basically gives you kind of inflection point. The function is zero, the first derivative is zero. The first derivative is zero means it should be a minimum or maximum, right? The second derivative is an inflection point. So this looks reasonable. Okay? So this is the solution that satisfies the initial condition and the uh, differential equation. Any question? Hmm? Uh, well, sorry. Right, right. No, no, it's a you have to challenge me like this. You shouldn't let me get away with uh, inaccurate statements like that. Uh, I should have said that is the point where the first and second derivatives are zero. Okay. An inflection point will be something like, like this. Right. You cannot have a minimum and that. Okay. So just thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Notes? Oh, sorry, it is not just two x of x. It is a combination of what is happening on the previous page, just that it goes over to the next part of the note. Okay. Because I have a plus there. Plus two x equals that. My apologies. Okay. So it's a continuation of what I'm doing is taking a flat transform of all the terms with the differential equation. So this is a flat transform of the last. Plus 2x. Plus 2x is equal to that. Okay. So maybe we should put a plus here and continuation from there. Okay. You had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. The, the k as t goes to minus 6 goes to a very large number. Okay, so because we have e 1 over e to the power of t, right? So it's going to go to uh, 0 exponentially down. And so the scale on the y axis is going to off. That's going to look different. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. 
Um, suppose you are doing a design and this is the solution and you want to evaluate numerically what is the solution at t equal to t. How would you do that? You have an expression here. Let me just throw the expression into that for example. Z is now the solution, but I want Z at uh, two minutes. Does this work? Why would it work? Gee, it's a symbol. <laughs> right. uh, well, there is a function I think that allows you to do that, and I think it's called sub. Sub Z. What it does is it takes the expression in the Z and substitutes the symbol in that expression with a number. And I'm going to do that. Good question. That's, 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 what, that's what I want every one of you to be able to do that, okay? Just what I did was, what I wanted to do was evaluate that solution at t equal to 2. Remember, I had this graph, right? So I want to know what is the value by three equal to two and what is the solution like? Look, I store the solution into a symbol called Z. Okay. Now the solution is stored in a symbol called Z. I think that probably went very quickly because I was just recalling. Yeah. Okay. On the very top here, what you see is I entered the I Laplace term one more time. And I said, okay, store this into Z. Okay, so then I can reuse it. Because if I angst would be replaced continuously. So it was a very poor practice for me to just leave the solution in A and S. So this one will be overwritten by something else. Because it uses the default variable angst for replacing it. So I said, I'll store it in Z. And then I'm going to evaluate what that function Z is when P is equal to 2. That's a substitution. Now, your question was, will it do for range, so let's do it for 2 to 3 in steps of let's do point 2. Okay, that's going to give me 2, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6, etc. Yeah. Really my question is that, you know, looking back and discovering my own, but if you have a function that I've asked, you know, the simple thing that I thought was a simple one, but you, you know, which one does it, how does it know which one sort of subject? Yes, you need to explore. Yeah. Uh, look at sub. Sub is actually a very powerful command. It will allow you to substitute individually one symbol with another symbol. Another symbol if you want. Plus numbers. Okay? So every command that I'm kind of showing you is the first door sense. Get you into that function, show you that the function exists. And then you need to be able to explore on your own. Okay. So what is that? What the such function does is it takes the expression z. Z is this expression. Okay? And take the, the first argument to such is that expression, whatever is contained in there. Then it looks for a default symbol in this case. So the second argument is that number is that symbol is substituted by the second argument. And then it evaluates it. If it is a number, it evaluates the number. If it is a symbol, I think, maybe we can try this. It should uh, replace it with a symbol. For example, I'm going to replace this by A. What do you think would happen? I don't know what will happen. <laughs> if you define A as a symbol. Uh, no, let me try that. No. So since is the one that defines A to be a symbol, replace whatever you have T by the symbol. Good question. I think you can. <laughs> uh, let's do A is equal to PQ. So I have a symbol A, which is PQ. I'm going to now explore what you're asking me to do. 
Maar hij zegt, take that symbol at z, replace it with a, a itself is with tq. That's what you're asking, right? An expression. So, symbolic processing is a very powerful tool within MATLAB, but it is depending on something called Maple. Maple is a symbolic uh, engine that provides all the services with symbolic processing. There are many more we will use later on how to extract the denominator of a function, numerator of the function, how to calculate the roots of a polynomial. They will tell us how to design the controller because the roots of the polynomial are going to determine the stability. Any other questions? These things, I think, hopefully, because I'm demonstrating and capturing it, you need to go back and play and uh, take it slowly because you may be going fast for some of you. Okay, so you need to spend more time on this one. Okay, so that's the solution: how to get a solution to a differential equation. Now, how about integral? Okay, if derivatives turn out to be multiplication by s. What would you guess integrals to be? Divide by, okay? And we saw one example where we said I want an integral action. So I put an integral term on the right hand side of the differential equation, I didn't know how to solve it. So we have a derivative on one term and the integral on the other side. But Laplace transform is a natural set because when you're taking the Laplace transform of an integral, all you need to do is replace it by 1 over x multiplied by the Laplace transform of the function. So if you take the integral once, you do it once. If you take the integral again, twice, it's like derivative many times. So every time you take an integral and then you take the Laplace transform, it is equal to dividing it by f one more time. And this is why both derivatives and integrals are converted into algebraic domains. And then we can easily manipulate solutions in the algebraic domain. Okay? So I have a number of examples from now on illustrating various cases. Here is a simple ordinary differential equation, dx dt plus x equal to 1. This you should be able to solve. Okay? And it's a first order equation, it's a linear equation, and one initial condition, x at 0 equal to 0. Okay? So apply the Laplace transform. So these two terms come from the derivative of dx dt, that is s times x of s minus x at 0 plus the Laplace transform of x itself, which is this one. On the right hand side, Laplace transform of 1, which is 1 over x. Okay? And in this case, the initial condition is 0, so that drops out. And I combine the two x terms, so x of s multiplied by 1 plus x equal to 1 over s. So here is the solution in the Laplace domain. How do I invert it? Obviously, I Laplace will help you because it's done it for a larger term. But now I'm going to illustrate, just to recall your memory, from factoring and partial fractions. Okay? So if you have to do it in an exam without MATLAB available to you, how do you do it? You write, this is the solution in the Laplace domain, but you write it as sum of two fractions. This is a method of partial fractions. So write it as A divided by S plus b divided by s plus 1. So we have s and s plus 1 in the denominator. So write it as some number divided by s and some number divided by s plus 1. So we need to find what a and b are in such a way the right hand side is equal to the left hand side. Okay? I'm sure you have seen this before. And so the way to find the constants a and b is very easy. So the first time I'm going to multiply every term in that equation by s. Okay? I'm going to multiply this by s, this by s, and this by s. Why? Then I can cancel this s with this, this x with this. Okay? And I have s here, and then that equation is valid for any s, right? So I can put s equal to 0. If I put s equal to 0, I drop out this term. And what I get is simply a equal to what is left here is s plus 1. But when I put s equal to 0, I'm going to get 1. So I get a is equal to 1. So the rules are, the procedures are, to evaluate one constant at a time, we multiply first by s, one other factor. Second, that we multiply by s plus 1, the other factor, every term. Basically, you are knocking off every term in the equation except one term at a time. 
Okay, that's the reason for doing that. Any questions from me going to this class? Okay. Next time, I'm going to. Is it okay? Uh, am I going fast? Some of you are writing down. Okay. The next time, I'm going to multiply every term, the original equation. So let me just start. Erase this. Okay. This time, I'm going to multiply every term by s plus 1. s plus 1, s plus 1. So what happens? The s plus 1 term gets cancelled. Here, the s plus 1 term gets cancelled. Okay. And then I'm saying I'm going to put s equal to minus 1. <coughs> Why? Then I can get rid of this term. If s equal to minus 1, this term will drop out. And I'll be left only with b. Okay. But I also have to put s equal to minus 1 on the left hand side. So I've cancelled this, I have 1 over s. But when it's s equal to minus 1, it's going to be minus 1. So b is equal to minus 1. I've illustrated that in detail in here. Okay. So this can be extended to any number of terms as long as you have distinct roots. Okay. None of the roots are repeating. Okay. There is the two factors in the denominator. For example, if you have s times s plus 1 squared, then 1 occurs with multiplicity of 2. That occurs twice. Root occurs twice. Okay. So whatever you learn in differential equations is extremely useful in the control course. I don't know what other courses, but you need to recall and use thought of those concepts in the control course. Okay. So you can now verify. You found out A and B, so the partial fraction is 1 over S minus 1 over S plus 1. You take a common factor, you'll get back your original expression. So the solution is, 1 over s divided by minus 1 over s plus 1. Now you look into the table in the Laplace transform. Okay? And 1 over s inverse transform is 1. 1 over s plus 1, the inverse transform for that is e to the power minus b. So the solution is x of t is equal to 1 minus e to the minus b. So this is the transferring back from the Laplace domain into the time domain. That's what the solution looks like. Obviously, if you have MATLAB, then you just pass whatever complicated expression you have in S domain. Uh, MATLAB does the factorization and everything for you. Any questions on that? So, this is uh, another example the case of three uh, distinct roots, real and distinct roots. So you have to consider several cases, real and distinct roots, complex roots, repeated roots. You have to know how to handle each one of them and uh, what is the physical interpretation for each one of these cases. Okay. So here, to make uh, uh, a distinction, I put some of the initial condition as not zero. X of zero is one, X prime is zero, X double prime is minus one. How does this change? It's really, uh, as long as you substitute the numbers, it shouldn't change anything. Uh, how are we doing for time? Okay, I guess uh, we will continue with this one in the next class. Okay.